Good morning, Ronnie Mead. Today we're continuing on our series on discipleship and justice, and it'll be our, our third session on that topic. And uh, <clears throat> last week when uh, Brian McConaughey from uh, Rantanac Ministries uh, was sharing with us, one scripture that he shared uh, really um, impressed me in particular, and that is the uh, scripture from Isaiah chapter 1, verse 17. And it says this, learn to do right, seek justice, defend the oppressed, take up the cause of the fatherless, and plead the case of the widow. But the word I want to focus in on this scripture is learn, learn to do right, to seek justice. And so it's, it's, an, it's an activity that we engage in to, to expand our, our knowledge and experience and horizons uh, and to, to come into God's mind and heart and activity. And uh, one, one simple definition of what it means to learn is to gain or acquire knowledge of something by study, by experience, or by, talk, be, by being taught. But um, more than anything, it means that taking the initiative having a learning stance in our lives to uh, be open to something new and to be changed and transformed. And so God is calling us to have a learning stance to, to learn and expose ourselves to new things in order to uh, partner with him in his activity in the kingdom. Another scripture is Proverbs 29, 7. And it says, the righteous know the rights of the poor. The wicked have no such understanding. So again, it, by If we're learning and, and having our eyes and ears open, we will come to know uh, the condition of those who are poor and oppressed and to know th their rights and to know God's heart for them. So how do we learn? Well, we learn by uh, watching, by listening, by pursuing something, by doing, by applying ourselves, and uh, uh, most importantly, by, by taking the initiative ourselves to step out and learn something new. And so first of all, we learn by, by, first of all, by looking to God, listening to God's heart, or watching him. It's all of our desire to uh, become like God. That's what it means to become holy and uh, to have, uh, to grow in God-like character. And uh, so we do that. And this is certainly true in the area of justice. In Exodus 3, verse 7, uh, it records how God came to help his people Israel to rescue them out of slavery and bondage in Egypt. And this is what it says. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I've heard them crying out because of their slave owners, and I am concerned about their suffering. So God saw, he heard, and he was concerned. And that needs to be reflected in our heart attitude also. Psalm 10, verse 17 to 18, puts it this way. You, Lord, hear the desire of the afflicted. You encourage them, and you listen to their cry, defending the fatherless and the oppressed. And so here we have again, God listens and he hears. And so we also need to listen and to hear. Uh, Psalm, 117, Psalm 11, verse 7 says, For the Lord is righteous, he loves justice. And so here we, we have a picture of God's heart around justice and the poor and the oppressed. He loves justice. And we read in other scriptures how he hates, he, he actually hates evil and injustice and oppression. And so we need to, if we're going to be like God, we need to love the right things and hate the right things also in his way. But God hears, he watches, and he takes the initiative. And so if we want to be like him and grow to be like him, we need to be like that also. Number two, it also involves listening to those around us, and in particular to those who are poor or oppressed and suffering injustice in any way. Again, this takes an initiative to do that. We, you know, we're all busy in our own lives and, and often feel stretched to the limit in terms of energy and, and, and time. And add to that our, our capacity to really not see anything outside of our own particular bubble. And yet God calls us to do that. And so we are 
not just invited, but actually commanded to be aware of those around us in the world around us who are suffering. Proverbs 21, 13 says, whoever shuts their ears to the cry of the poor will also cry out and not be answered. So we had to open our ears and not shut them to the cry of the poor. There's many ways that we find it convenient just to kind of shut our eyes and ears and just um, not hear, not be aware of the needs of the poor. And again, Proverbs 28, verse 27 says, those who give to the poor poor will lack nothing, but those who close their eyes to them receive many curses. Wow, that's <laughs> that's uh, kind of a strong word, but it, again, it, it tells us how important this is to open our ears, to open our eyes, and to hear and see the cry of those around us uh, who are suffering and uh, are in need of help. And God calls us to do that. Today, I'm going to be interviewing two people, and I've asked them to share their own experiences around injustice and racism. And this uh, is a chance for us to learn and to grow uh, by listening and watching others. And, uh, you know, very often, especially in Canada, racism and injustice can often be subtle, but still just as real and still just as wrong and evil. And so I'm going to ask you, as you listen to these two interviews, uh, that you watch for those, those subtle evidences of racism and injustice. So let's watch these interviews now. Yeah, thank you, Norlanda, for joining with me for this interview this morning as part of our Discipleship and uh, Justice series at Runnymede. And uh, just before we start, there, there may be people, you're well-known and, and well-loved at Runnymede, but uh, there may be people joining us this morning who, uh, who don't know you so well. So could you share a bit about yourself and your background just to start off with? Oh, thank you. Good morning, Pastor Steve. Oh, where should I start? Oh, well, I was born in the Highland and the Caribbean. Most people don't know the name of, when I say like it's Hispaniola, they're like, oh, where is that? Hispaniola, it's actually 80 and the Dominican Republic, that's the uh, the actual name of the island itself. So, and I came here, I came to Canada, Ottawa, I would say, I was a little kid. Uh, so basically I don't really know my country of birth. Uh, the only country that I know it's this, this country. I always uh, say it like I'm like the adopted kid and you know, like you go up with your adopted parents and that's all you know. And that's basically my story in terms of uh, of Canada. I love Canada, uh, like a lot. Um, very loyal to this country. Um, I love the snow, even though I'm somebody from, uh, from originally from the Caribbean. I really love the snow. Like my favorite, uh, favorite uh, season, it's the fall. And so, yeah, so very, I would say, very happy growing up in Ottawa. I feel privileged that I grew up there. Um, even though Ottawa is not as multi, at, at the time I was growing up there uh, as a child, it was not very multicultural, uh, especially in the Francophone community. Um, you mm -hmm. find people from the Caribbean, but they were mostly uh, people from the British islands, the British Caribbean, so people who spoke English. Right. And so uh, a lot of the time in the school, because I attended uh, Francophone school, uh, because I spoke French, it was so much easier to integrate the school system because I already speak, uh, spoke French. So, um, so I attended French school. My experience was a lot of the time I was the only black kid in my school or the only black kid in my class. And I think it's changed a bit, the landscape changed, the demographic landscape changed when I got into high school. You would see more people like of a uh, different ethnic background. Um, I actually had yeah, like my first black friend, I think I was in grade 12. So, almost at the end of my high school year. 
I, I really had like a, I could call that person like a friend, but most yeah. of my friends were uh, Caucasian. Wow. All Lebanese, all Lebanese because they were, there's yeah. a lot of Lebanese in Ottawa. Yeah. Right. Well, that's really interesting. Um, have you ever experienced racism yourself? And, and if so, would you care to share a few stories? Oh, yes. Unfortunately, yes. Um, but the thing, I think, I don't know if it's because, you know, as a child, you're innocent. I didn't experience a racism as a child. I didn't see it. I only had one experience. I think I was in grade five and I reported it to my teacher and that was it. Uh, growing up in Ottawa, I, you know, I already had like my friends. It was all the people that I knew from the same primary school. Uh, we did all grade five together and we end up, most of us end up going to the same high school. So I already had like my group of friends. So I felt like I was very isolated from uh, racism. For sure, there were, there were instances where there were microaggression. I just stuff that people said, but it was not like overt. Um, I guess like I would say I started to really realize there was racism, like really experienced racism when I got into university. Uh, like in my 20s and and coming here, I was really shocked. I was really disappointed at Toronto. Coming in Toronto, knowing that it was a multicultural uh, city. And I would say from my experience, I find Toronto, there's even more, there's more racism in Toronto than Ottawa. Wow. It, it's really, it's strange to say that, but I've seen it. I don't know if it's because at the time I moved here, at the age I had moved or, or what, or is it because Ottawa was, was my town? I knew a lot of people, so it was my comfort uh, zone. So yeah, a lot of, uh, most of my experience with racism I've been here in Toronto and I've, I've uh, and it's unfortunate, a lot of it I've been in the church itself. Uh, mm -hmm. Not only at Ranimede, I've experienced it at the first Bone Again Church that I attended, um, which uh, I'm not going to name the, the church. Um, the church consider itself multicultural. But however, when you attend the service on Sunday, it was very segregated. You will see mm -hmm. oh, all the Filipino sitting all together, all the people from the Caribbean sitting together and all the Caucasian all together. I did not like that picture for me. That was not, it's, it's not me. It's interesting yeah. what you say about the experiencing it in the church because, and, and, and I think most people would not consider themselves racist or, and they may just be, well, there's a lot of talk these days about unconscious bias. Yes. And uh, so it's interesting you, you talk about that. Can you kind of unpack that a bit more for people to kind of, that they can understand what that looks like um, from your point of view? Well, uh, the thing is my point of reference, I always go, okay, as Christian, the standard is higher. The bar is higher because mm -hmm. um, of, as followers of Jesus, it's always about the love, loving each other, loving mm -hmm. our neighbor. So that's, for me, that's fundamental. And I always do that contrast between the different circle that I navigate. And like, it's not because my circle, it's not only the church, it's not only running me. Um, I have other, or I have work, I have other social circle of, of people that I interact with who are non-believers. And sometimes I find that they were they were more accepting. Of, well, they were accepting of me. And I've had instances where sometimes it's a look. And I can say, like, as a visible minority, I cannot explain it. It's like, I call it, it's like this radar that you have, and you know it. And for me, also, it's sometimes uh, interaction with people. Uh, sometimes I have, I'm going to tell you something that happened. Okay. Um, Something that happened, I was with, uh, I think maybe I was at the church for about a year and I was talking to someone that I was friends with and two people came, okay? 
the two people, young people, they came. Um, um, they wanted to invite her to their Bible study group. Okay. Do you know, I think they spent like maybe 10 minutes, five between five to 10 minutes, zero acknowledgement. No, hi, how are you? Who's your friend? Zero, zero, no eye contact. And I felt like I go, oh, okay, what's wrong with this picture? Is it because these people are rude? They, they don't know any better and how to, you know, how to interact with people because I thought that that behavior was very rude. And then, of course, you're going to go to that place. It's like, is it racial? Is it because the color of my skin? Because I felt like if, if I was a Caucasian person, that would have never occurred. Um, and, you know, it's like different behaviors that sometimes like looks people will give me when they think I'm not looking. But unfortunately, I don't know that for some reason, I will catch those look. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And there's those look, those non-verbal cues that you get from people and you can, you, you just get it, what they're saying. Right. It's just yeah. unfortunate because I think it's part of the culture. The culture, it's all about politeness. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and, you know, people want to look good, but when inside they are giving, that's a big, people don't even realize they're giving out those cues. And, you know, I had people who asked me questions that were kind of ridiculous in terms of, uh, me being a lawyer, if I pass the bar, how am I supposed to answer that question? I, like most people, universally speaking in most countries, if somebody is a lawyer, they have write a bar exam. And I cannot call myself, it would be illegal for myself to call myself a lawyer if I didn't pass the bar exam. So I felt that I would have never got that question if I was a Caucasian person. Mm. Oh, I had a question, oh, um, are you a lawyer here in this country? Yeah. And I felt also it was because of my the color of my skin. Mm. That question was asked, which mm. is totally, I just, people don't even realize when they say those things. For me, I call it, you're giving me so much intel on yourself. You're telling me so much on yourself. It's not even, it's, it ceased to be about me. You're not even hurting me. For me, uh, the Lord have taught me in those situations that to look with his eyes and see like with more compassion for these people. And for sure, there are sometimes I'm very frustrated. And it's very hurtful. But I find that with the experience of racism in the church, uh, it made my relationship with the Lord so much close. And mm -hmm. it's such a blessing. And it's just so real for me. Like when the Bible is coming alive, you know, you have those verses that the, the Lord do take care of the ones that are rejected, the one that are despised. And he does. And I tell you, Pastor Steve, when these situations happen, I see the Lord so much more, so much more. Yeah. Well, thanks yeah. for sharing yeah. that. Those personal yeah. experiences. Yeah. Too. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's very yeah. powerful. Yeah. What, yeah. In, your opinion, in your opinion, what can the church be doing to pursue justice more, especially around this, you know, racism and systemic injustice and, well, I think for me, I'm all about, I call myself a chatterbox. I can get going and talking. I'm someone who believes in dialogue and I'm someone who's not afraid of getting messy, basically. If there's a conflict, most of my friend knows that about me. There's a conflict. No longer will get it out, get it out of the table and get it resolved and move on. Because I don't like uh, grudges and, and, and I find that's the problem with the church. And I think the church itself, it's a bit afraid of addressing the issue. And I think they don't wanna create conflict. They don't wanna make people uncomfortable. But I'm just gonna quote Pastor Mike because he always said that sometimes you have to be uncomfortable. Right. Yeah. yeah. 
yeah and uh, yeah and it's and just to mention pastor mark it's it's somebody over the years and that the lord have put the you know diversity about diversity in the church and right. and he's done so much in terms of that but there's so much he can do as just mm -hmm. as one person and who have that heart for diversity and yeah. Yeah, and I feel that we can just go. It's like it's just we scratch only the surface. <laughs> Sometimes people see diversity. Oh, yeah, we have ethnic food. We have the food of this different uh, country. No, this is not about diversity. Diversity is or uh, uh, addressing racism. It's having an honest dialogue, honest yes. dialogue. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. there's so many ways. And it's not. And I think people think, yeah, for sure. There are some forums where people go about the racism. It's more about like shaming people. And as, as a believer, I don't believe in shaming people because that's not the way of God. It's right. not the way in shaming. Even us, when we commit an offense or a sin, he doesn't shame us. He yeah. doesn't shame us. But he, does, he wants us to come uh, at the cross and confess. And I have a dialogue with him and examine what went wrong and what's going on. And, and I think that's what the church we should do. And, and it's just starting by a dialogue. It's as simple as that. As yeah. simple as that. And people mm -hmm. willing to open their hearts and being brave. Yeah. Because I'm mm -hmm. not going to use the word vulnerable. I don't believe in that. For me, it's, it's all about being brave. Yeah. Right. Yes. Yeah. Brave and, and and being strong. Yeah. What you've said is really um, gives us a lot uh, as Christians to, to think about and pursue. So thanks again. Thank and, you. Uh, and we'll uh, we'll we'll look forward to having more conversations on this topic. I'd like to introduce uh, Rebecca Cowboy, who I met in 2015 at uh, Catch the Fire Leader School. And uh, uh, we've known each other uh, since then. And I want to thank you, Rebecca, for joining us this morning at uh, Running Me Church for our series on discipleship and uh, justice. And so just to start off with, uh, Rebecca, could you share a bit about yourself in terms of your background and, and what you're doing now? Hi, Steve. Um, I'm originally from um, James Bay, Quebec a town named Muskegness, I'm Cree. Um, right now, I'm, I live in Thunder Bay for school. So I'm in, I'm in, in this program. Um, it's called um, Aboriginal Community Advocacy. So it's my second semester. Right. Great. Thanks. And uh, so um, the first question is, uh, have you experienced racism or, or justice um, in, in, in your life in the past? And are there examples that you uh, feel comfortable sharing about? Um, there, there are a few. When I, when, I, when I lived in the city in Montreal or school way back, um, I think there was um, one actually that I can really remember. Um, my friend and I were walking down the street, a car, pulled over and started chanting. And I didn't really pay attention because back then I wasn't born again. So, but in Toronto I lived, I did have few, um, but not really name calling. But, but just past weekend, I did experience something here at the hospital um, where the receptionist wasn't really um was was really cru cruel to me so but yeah like um i don't know when you're walking you always have that um thought am i going to be mistreated um but since all uh, probably three years or less than five i guess i've been learning especially three i've been learning to walk and not think of being a victim Mm -hmm. but, but it's kind of like, um, how do I say? It's kind of like, it's in me where I think, is it okay? I'm always asking that question. 
is it okay? Even though I'm not asking it, yes. in my mind, I'm all, is it okay? Is it, is it okay to sit over there? Is it okay to stand here? Or is it okay to speak? I'm always asking those questions. Back in my mind, even though I don't want to ask them, there's always, there, it's always there. Right, yeah. It's just under the surface, I guess. Yeah, especially if I go to these government or places like the, where government, um, like hospitals, offices, like that, I'm just, sometimes the fear can grip me. <laughs> I recall when I, when I first met you in 2015 too, I met members of your family. Um, you know, I think it was your mom and your stepdad or something. And so, some members of your family had actually been impacted by the residential school system. In that. Uh, am, I, am I remembering that correctly or? Yes, um, both of my parents went and they were not comfortable with um, non -in, non-Indigenous people. Mm -hmm. I think once they received healing, they were more, a little bit more comfortable. Right, yes. Yeah, yeah, same as me. Like when I grow up in reservation, I don't really, I didn't really pay attention with other people outside unless I go out from my reservation. Then I start to, yeah. I guess, not, um, recognize other people. But once I did the school ministry way back 2002 and three, I didn't know I had issues as well. Right. Um, I wasn't really comfortable with non-Indigenous people, but one of my um, trips doing outreach with the with the group that's when um, um, God just healed me. It's kind of like um, it's hard to explain it. It's like a supernatural um, encounter I had with God, where um, the Spirit of God just came down on me, and then I started like. Um, because I didn't grow up in Paws. I, the Crees are known like trappers and hunters, but we did drum for a game, um, but I never chanted. But when I had that encounter with God, like when the spirit of God came down, I felt something. I never felt it again. I wish I recorded it. The school, my school classmates experienced it and the pastors experienced it as well. They seen it. Something mm -hmm. came down from heaven and went through and I started chanting and I never heard that kind of chant that came from heaven. Like mm -hmm. I do hear like power chants chanting. Mm -hmm. It didn't sound like that, but similar, almost similar. But the girl that started seeing a vision, she saw indigenous woman dancing and breaking the walls. Right. She said like, um, I believe the word is for Rebecca. God is saying for you to be free, the person he created you. So mm -hmm. as she said that, that's when I felt something going going from my head down. Right. Then I started embracing, embracing who I am. Like I wasn't ashamed to talk in my native language. All of a sudden, I, I was looking at my skin, how, how beautiful it was. And I started embracing who I am, accepting myself. Yes. But now, like, um, growing up in, in the province of Quebec, I, I feel the deep um, compassion to French people. I never mm -hmm. felt like that. And I do, the way I look at it, if someone has an issue or hatred to another race, it's not my issue. It's their issue. It could mm -hmm. be, like, generational. It could be land history of it or that person has their own issue of mm -hmm. not accepting another race yes. that's how I view it now mm -hmm. and um, I always remember this quote someone said "Who whose opinion will matter at the end of the day so I try not to take that offense mm -hmm. when I when the receptionist the other day mistreated me I did not want to take that and take that what I felt it when she wasn't really nice to me. But now mm -hmm. that I'm 
learning about Indigenous people of Canada or other tribes in the world, the way we want to, like, um, you want to educate people to understand what the other race, that's the, I think that's the key, is mm -hmm. educating people about their race and recognizing them who they are yeah. and respecting them. I think, and to be heard, I think it, that is the most, one of the most is to be heard. Yes, yeah. That's, um, that's really interesting. And uh, thank you for sharing the, the, those personal stories of, um, of healing and the, the, the Holy Spirit's work in your life. The third question um, I mentioned to you that I was going to ask was, um, in your opinion, what can the church be doing to pursue justice, um, especially in the area of, of racism and uh, systemic injustice? Uh, and is there any specific message you would like to communicate to the church about that? So what can we be, what can the church be doing more? I, I think what I said, like edu educate yourself right. to know, to know indigenous people. There are three groups, like the First Nations, the Inuit, the Métis. And the First Nations, there's so many tribes. That's me, like Cree. I think the first will be like educating yourself, the history of it. And um, seeing the past and like coming into like repentance, not just repentance, um, acknowledging and to be, to hear them, to hear their stories and ask them, what do they really need? I don't think some of them will say, I need a car. <laughs> I, we just need to be heard and respected. We've been talking some more on the side there in terms of what more the church can be doing around these justice issues. And uh, could you share a bit more about that? Uh, I, I talked about um, how like the churches in Canada, like they, they invest a lot in missionaries outside Canada and why not in these indigenous remote areas help them to have access to water and, um, and housing, like start helping them with, to build the houses that are affordable and like many of the indigenous communities don't have run, running water. Um, I would love to see that someday. Yes, yeah. Is there anything else you'd like to share? Um, okay, here's, it's always on my mind about, um, I don't know if you ever heard about TRC, Truth and Reconciliation. Yes. Um, and, to me, like reconciliation is um, when you look at a person, you don't see their race, you don't see their religion or um, where they go to, what kind of church, what denomination they go to. To me, reconciliation is when you see that person the way God sees them and accepting them, what God created them to be. Because I didn't choose to be an indigenous, like God made me to be indigenous. Right. Yeah. Like I'm just on a journey where I am understanding more and accepting myself and to love myself and not be walking shame. Yes. Yeah. Well, thank you, thank you very much, and thank you, uh, Rebecca, for taking the time to uh, talk with me today. I want to thank. Norlanda and Rebecca again for um, helping with today's message. Did you notice though that uh, in response to the question, what can the church do? Both uh, Norlanda and Rebecca said the same thing. They talked about the importance of listening and learning. And so that we need to really take that to heart. In Jeremiah 22, 16, I know I've, I've used a lot of scriptures today. Uh, and that's partly the result of studies I've done over the last month. And I've just been amazed at the number of scriptures in the Bible on this whole issue of justice. I, I collected uh, all the best and, and it, it um, um, amounted to uh, 260 verses. 
and uh, that's not even all of them. So I'm sharing some of those today that have been challenging me and inspiring me over the last few weeks. Jeremiah 22, 16 says, Is that not what it means to know me, declares the Lord, to defend the cause of the poor and needy? And uh, so we all want to know God and, and grow in intimacy in our relationship with God. And uh, it's good to remember that as we do that, God will share his heart with us. And that will include, inevitably, uh, a concern uh, for justice and to be involved in that. And so, key word today is initiative. And I'm just going to finish with one more scripture. Ezekiel 22, 28 to 30. It's a very interesting one. Here, the prophet Ezekiel is challenging uh, the people of God about their behavior, about their relationship with God and their relationship uh, to the oppressed. And he says this, your prophets whitewash your deeds for you by false visions and lying divinations. They say, this is what the Lord, the sovereign Lord says when the Lord has not spoken. The people of the land practice extortion and commit robbery. They oppress the poor and the needy and mistreat the foreigner, denying them justice. And then he goes on and says this, I looked for someone among them who would build up the wall and stand before me in the gap on behalf of the land so that I would not have to destroy it. But I found no one. God in those days and today is looking for people who will stand in the gap and build the wall and continue his work of the kingdom, of pursuing justice and serving the poor. Will you and I be those people who will respond to that call and be the people that God is looking for to stand in the gap through our prayers, or through learning, and through our actions, both individually and corporately? Will we, will, will we be those people? Focus today has been on learning and listening and watching. And uh, there are many ways that we can do that. Every week uh, in the uh, Running Mead News, there are, are links to sort resources that, that we can access. And I encourage you, and I'm challenging myself too, to really pursue this and to grow in our understanding and knowledge. I, with Linda Ruth's help, I've put together a list of resources that you can access on the internet. And uh, all of these names and ministries are, are um, reliable and, and, and give good sound teaching on this whole area. And so I encourage you to check out some of these uh, people on the internet in order to grow. I invite you now just to pray with me. Lord God, you are a God who loves justice and hates oppression and evil and injustice. Soften our hearts so that we can be aware suffering and the needs for justice around us. Lord, break us out of our comfort zone and lead us to where your heart is for justice. We want to know you more, Lord, not just your love and your mercy for us, but also to know what you are passionate about and to share in your great heart for justice. We ask you, Lord, to continue to disturb us, to shake us, to be at work within, within us by your Holy Spirit, leading us into the truth. Lord, we want to live lives that are pleasing to you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to end with that benediction again from Ephesians chapter 3. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly beyond all we can ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen.